Hi there. Um, I'm Dr. AJ Kumar. Um, we're going to finish reading 1.4.7 right now. All right. This is uh, R10. It's algebra. There will be a link to buy it down in the description. One second. Um, <clears throat> so I've outlined the argument a couple of times, but let's just get into it. Proof of theorem 1.4.10. The first assertion of C, so C, if A prime is obtained from A by multiplying rho, so we're trying to prove that supposing we have these three properties, then each of these. So he starts with C for some reason, of course, and that makes sense, uh, is a part of the linearity. So, right, this is just lin the first thing is that if you multiply rho i by a scalar, then determinant of a prime equals c. That's just linearity. That makes sense. If a row the second assertion of c follows because a row that is zero can be multiplied by zero yeah okay that so what he's saying is you can take a maybe I, I would instead say you can multiply the row by negative one here the, the I think a better argument would be um, if you have a row that's one or a row that is all zeros then so determinant, uh, let me switch to a different color, then you would have, you have a bunch of zeros here, this is equal to, you can multiply this by m minus 1, so let's call this A, and if you multiply this by minus 1 and then use the linearity, you would get that uh, delta of A is equal to use the linearity minus delta of A because it's linear in each row, right? It's n linear. It's not just, right? Um, <clears throat> the, only num the only number that has the property that it equals its own additive inverse is 0. Okay, A, B, and D, when I and J are adjacent indices. Okay. Right, okay. To simplify our display, we represent the matrices schematically, denoting the rows in question by R equals row I, and S equals row J, and suppressing the notation for other rows. Okay. So RS denotes our given matrix A. Then by linearity in the ith row, R plus CSS is R is delta times RS plus C times delta I of SS, right, by the third property. So this is saying that the uh, the row adder has determinant equal to the original matrix. So if you add a multiple of one row to another row, then um, to a different row, right? That this is okay. This this he he's making a okay. So this is say okay. So B, the swapper, okay. Okay, so for B, we use A repeatedly. Okay, so he's saying we're writing a swapper out of um, adder matrices, okay. Delta of RS equals delta of R minus S over S equals delta of R minus S over S plus R minus S. Right, so we, you just inserting the identity, okay. So this is delta of R minus S over R, which is delta of at minus S over R, which is minus delta of S. Okay, that makes sense. Um, that makes perfect sense. Each one of these steps doesn't change the value of the matrix except this, or of the determinant, and at the end you get determinant of RS is equal to minus determinant of uh, SR. So that's all. Let me switch to a different color. Where is? 
determinant of at the end you get determinant of RS is equal to minus determinant of SR. So finally D for adjacent indices follows from C and 1.4.73. Okay. What is D? Okay, so it's saying that uh, if rho i is equal to a multiple of rho j and i is equal to j, it's basically, I think he's just saying, fill in the argument yourself. Ah, so what it's saying is rescale rho, so uh, rho i is equal to a multiple of rho j and they're distinct rows then rescale rho i and that um, that will give you c times the determinant of the new matrix but then the determinant of the new matrix will be zero because it has two equal rows okay if you don't believe me fill out that logic for yourself it makes sense okay so to complete the proof we verify a b and d for arbitrary pair of distinct indices one minute Suppose rho i is a multiple of rho j, we switch adjacent rows a few times to obtain, okay, so you, you're just, so uh, we switch adjacent rows a few times to obtain a matrix A prime in which the two rows in question are adjacent. So what he's saying is any other case, you can reduce it to the adjacent rows case. Then D for adjacent rows tells us that D of A prime equals zero. B for adjacent rows tells us that D of A prime is equal to plus or minus, that's interesting, A prime, delta of A, so delta of A equals zero in this, what? I, he's, See, this is, I mean, this is what happens when you work for the CIA. You come up with ridiculous stuff. He's saying that you can reduce any other case to the case of adjacent rows. So, so, what he's saying is keep switching adjacent rows until you get a matrix. So, you want, you're trying to prove that row I is a multiple of row J. And which one is this? row i is a multiple of row j and j okay so he's trying to show d that's the premise of d row i is a multiple of row j we switch adjacent rows a few times okay move them so they're adjacent then d for adjacent rows okay tells us that d of a prime is equal to zero and b for adjacent rows. Ah, okay. So what he's saying is that we can prove we can if 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 what he's trying to prove is the case where you have let, let me give an example. Um, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, and then I'm gonna multiply this by two. So I'd get two, four, six. And so the determinant of this is zero because you have this row that's a constant multiple of this row. Okay, but what he's saying is, okay, you take this matrix and you multiply it by a swapper that swaps these two, okay? And then you would get one, two, three, two, four, six, and now we've reduced it to an adjacent rows case Okay, and then this determinant is equal to zero. Okay, but we obtained this by doing some finite number of swaps, which will either, which will each, each single swap will negate the sign of the determinant of A. Uh, so this is A. Each single swap, this is A. Okay, each single swap will negate the determinant. Okay, but it doesn't matter, we've negated we're negating zero, so determinant of the original thing has to be zero. 
That's all he's saying. And then he's saying, figure out the rest of it yourself for A and B. Yeah, he, he proves it for for at this point the proofs we have given. So all he's saying is reduce it always to a case of adjacent indices. But let's think about this. So if we do a row adder, ah, so if we do a bunch of swaps to get adjacent, so for the row adder, he proved it for adjacent indices, but we do a bunch of swaps to get to an adjacent matrix, and then we undo those swap, you know, prove that it's same determinant, and then undo those swaps, then the signs will cancel out. I guess that's the argument. Um, Okay, and then, right, if we do a bunch of swaps, ooh, this, uh, I think you need some logic about permutations to do part B. Part B, what he's talking about is the, um, is the idea that every, It's almost similar to the idea that every um, permutation can be written as a product of transpositions, which he's probably going to prove in 1.5, in section 1.5. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. I told you that these arguments are kind of... Eh. Okay. Right, the rules show how a multiplication by an elementary matrix... Uh, affects delta and they lead to the next corollary. I'm just done with that proof because it, it I, I can't do the mental gymnastics live. Uh, the, the, I think the mental gymnastics, I mean... So... He didn't prove it, he just sort of outlined how you might go about proving it. So maybe that's an exercise for you if you don't believe this. And I, I frankly don't care that much about this proof. Um, I'm interested in how things work and not really getting... Uh, I should, I should, but I don't want to right now. Maybe, maybe I will in another video. Okay, maybe, maybe this is depth level two of our compiler analysis is just understanding how each of these individual arguments work. I'm moving on, okay? I just want to move on, and so whatever excuse tickles your fancy. I better be recording with the right microphone. Uh, looks like I am. <clears throat> uh, 1.4.13, let delta be a function, so here is properties 1.4.7, a function on n by n matrices with the property 1.4.7, and let E be an elementary matrix. For any matrix A, determinant of EA is equal to the determinant of E times the determinant of A. Moreover, if E is of the first kind, add a multiple of one row to another, then the determinant of E is equal to one. And one way you can see this is because what I said earlier, which is for each of those, quote, elementary matrices, which I called the Gauss matrices, um, you envision what that matrix does to the identity, and that's how you can cook up the matrix. So, you know, if you have uh, one of these elementary matrices E, it's going to be E times the identity matrix. So whatever operation it would affect on the identity matrix is equal to E. That's the way to think about it. Um, <clears throat> e is the outcome of applying E to the identity matrix. That's another way to think about it. Um, v is of the first kind, add a multiple of one row to another, then determinant of E is equal to one. V is of the second kind, row interchange, if it's just a finite swap, so one, one transposition. If you do two transpositions, then... Um, if E is of the second kind, row interchange, then the determinant of E is equal to minus one. If E is of the third kind, multiply by a row by C, then determinant of E is equal to C. You know what I might do? I might do a revelation where I just iron out the... where I really dig into this and iron out this argument. I might do that. I'll think about it. 
Um, the rules, 1.4.10, because I also don't like the real numbers, and I also want to see what happens if you do this to the complex numbers. The rules, 1.4.10, okay. Describe the effect of an elementary matrix row operation on determinant of A, so they tell us how to deter compute determinant of EA from determinant of A. They tell us that determinant of EA is equal to epsilon determinant of A, where epsilon is equal to 1, minus 1, or C, according to the type of elementary matrix. By setting A equals I, we find that determinant of E is equal to determinant of E times I is equal to epsilon times the determinant of I, which is equal to epsilon. Okay. So, deter okay, so he's so showing, he, he, that's kind of a confusing argument, but it makes sense. Um, proof of the multiplicative property. Okay. We imagine the first step of a row reduction. So I'm going to do a video pretty soon once I work out the logic, and i got to clean up my code. I'm going to do another video where I just clean up, where you can watch me clean up my code. I know that'll be super interesting, but, you know, uh, more programming videos, the better. Um, suppose we have shown that determinant of A prime B is equal to determinant of A prime determinant of B. We apply corollary 1.4.13. Determinant of E, determinant of A is equal to determinant of A prime. Since A prime B is equal to E of AB, the corollary also tells us that the determinant of A prime B is equal to determinant of E, determinant of AB, thus... Uh, okay, let me reread read that. So we're doing a row reduction on A, EA is equal to A prime. We're trying to show that the determinant in general is multiplicative. Okay, so he's showing maybe some sort of recursive argument. I got to think about this. Suppose we we have shown that determinant of a prime b is equal to determinant of a. Where where is b? Let me reread them. If for any n by n matrices a and b, determinant of a b is equal to determinant of a determinant of b. Okay. So. Imagine the first step of a row reduction, determinant EA is equal to A prime. Suppose we have shown the determinant of A prime B is equal to the determinant of A prime determinant of B. We apply the corollary, determinant of E, determinant of A. Okay. Okay. Since A prime B is equal to EAB, the corollary also tells us the determinant of a prime, determinant of e, determinant of a b. Thus, determinant of e, determinant of a b is equal to delta of a prime b, equals delta of a prime delta of b, delta of e, delta of a, delta of b. Canceling delta of e. Okay, so he's going to prove the multiplicative property for matrices in row-reduced echelon form. That's clever. And then use the... Okay, okay. So he's structuring his recursion in a silly way, but... Then A is either the identity, or else its bottom row is zero. That's a property of row-reduced echelon form, which we're going to talk about. Um, I think we, maybe we talked about it already. Not sure then A is either, so we may suppose that A is row reduced. Then either A is the identity or else its bottom row is zero. The property is obvious when A is equal to the identity matrix. If the bottom row of A is zero, so is the bottom row of AB. And theorem 1.4.10, yeah, so what he's saying is that um, I like writing out multipl matrix multiplication in my tabular form. I think it's a superior... Let me give myself some more room. So, the way I write matrix multiplication... Let me just show you an example. And i got to give myself a lot of room. X, Y... Uh, I'm not going to do multicolors. And then um, Z, W. Okay. This is AX plus BY, CX plus DY, uh, AZ plus BW, 
and uh, CZ plus DW. You can just see how they kind of zip together like this. They, they, you kind of just zip them and then take a sum. It's, it's uh, zip width is basically how, how it's working. Sum of zip width times. So in, in Haskell, it's uh, sum dot uh, zip width times. That would be the Haskell code for uh, dot product. Dot is equal to sum dot dip width, zip width. Um, <clears throat> anyway, putting that aside, my oh my point is is that uh, it's fairly easy to see in this tabular form that if you have a row that is all zeros, the effect on the product is it zeros out the resulting row. So that that's how you see that. Um, Right, and theorem 1.4.10, because you can, right, shows that delta of A equals delta of AB is equal to zero. Property is true for this case as well. Proof of the uniqueness of the determinant, theorem 1.4.7. Ah, okay, this is maybe the heart and soul where I'm lost. Okay, bottom of 22. There are two parts. To prove uniqueness, we perform row reduction on a matrix A. Say A prime is equal to ek down to e1 of a. Corollary 1.4.13 tells us how to compute d of a from d of a prime. If a prime is the identity, then d of a prime is equal to 1. Otherwise, the bottom row of 0, of a prime is 0, and in that case, theorem 1.4.10 shows that d of a prime is equal to 0. Okay. Ah, okay. This determines... Wait, for, right, from the multiplicative property. Okay. Okay, this determines D of A in both cases. Ah, okay, so if D of A prime is equal to zero, then none of the identity matrices have, or none of the um, Gauss matrices, the elementary matrices, have determinant zero. Those all have non-zero determinants. So, if, if you row reduce it and you get something that has a zero row at the bottom, which means that A is not invertible, then the determinant of A prime is equal to zero, and so you have, you get the case where you have a zero, okay, let me rewrite, E, or A prime, so the row reduced echelon form of A, let me let me just call that row reduced echelon form of A is equal to, in my notation, Gauss N down to Gauss, uh, no, we shouldn't use N, K down to Gauss 1 of uh, applied to A. All of these have non-zero determinant. So if r is equal to zero, it must be the case that a is equal to zero because a doesn't, because uh, rational numbers don't have these zero divisors. Okay, but if r, if the determinant of r, so the determinant of r is either going to be one or zero. If the determinant of r is one, then you would get from the multiplicative property um, determinant of a is equal to one over determinant determinant of Gauss K product down to determinant of Gauss 1 just from the multiplicative properties right okay that's that's all that's all that's going on here that's what he's telling me so this is also how because the Gauss K's this product is equal to a inverse the product Gauss K down to Gauss 1 that's how you get the determinant of a inverse is 1 over the determinant of a, except in the case where um, a is not invertible, in which case a inverse doesn't exist. So, that's fun. <sighs> Note, it is a natural idea to try defining determinants using compatible... Okay, i got to think about this. It is a natural idea to try to define determinants... Where is the end of this proof? Ah, way the way down there. Okay. 
natural idea to try to defining determinants using compatibility with matrix multiplication and corollary 1.4.13 says we can write an invertible matrix as a product of elementary matrices. These products determine the determinant of every invertible matrix. But there are many ways to write a given matrix as such a product without going through some steps as we have. It won't be clear that two such products will give the same answer. It isn't easy to make this idea work, okay? To complete the proof of theorem 1.4.7, we must show that the determinant function we have defined has the properties 1.4.7. This is done by induction on the size of the matrices. Okay, let's look at our product of 1.4.7. Um, okay, so it, it we're doing it for uh, we're doing recursion, which in math is called induction. Um, proof by recursion in math is called induction. Um, I, they're exactly the same idea. I don't know why we have two different words. Um, 1.4.7, determinant of i is equal to 1. Okay, so the one by one identity matrix. Yeah, so determinant of a is equal to a in the one by one case. So determinant of the one by one identity matrix is 1 is equal to 1. That's true. Row linearity, yeah, that's trivially true. Uh, two rows are equal, well, that's trivially true. Um, and if you have a, right, if you have a row that's all zero, right, okay. Zeros and the determinant is zero, so that works. So we assume they've been proved for determinants of n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrices, then all of the properties, so recursion, that's what we're doing. So here are, here are the properties, of course. Two adjacent rows also works in general. Okay. If a is equal to the identity then a11 is equal to 0 is equal to 1 and a new 1 is equal to 0 when new is greater than 1 so this is saying that uh, in the identity matrix the first column is 1 and a bunch of zeros all zeros that's what that that's what uh, where is my that's what this is saying oops you know what i mean that's what this one is saying um the expansion, where is 1.4.5? Okay, that's the formula. I'm not going to go look it up. Yeah, okay, so he's just, right. So he's saying that, well, this is 1, 1, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the reduction is, it's it's this times the determinant of this submatrix, which by recursion we assume is 1. Okay, that's what he's saying. To prove linearity, I'm not going to go look at 1.4.8. Okay, the linearity in each, we show linearity in each of the terms in the expansion. Note that determinant nu1, determinant of d nu1, is equal to c a nu1, Oh my god, what? Okay. Okay, I understand one, the formula 1.4.14. For reference, let's just go back to 1.4.8. Maybe take a screenshot and put that in a side panel. This is just the... Uh, that that's, that's the notation that's going on right here. Okay, this is what he's talking about. Where the hell are we? Okay. D nu 1, determinant of D nu 1, is equal to C. Okay, we're, we're showing... Where the hell does K come from? Let K be as in one, for fuck's sake. Where, what the fuck is K? Where is K? 
Okay, here is K. Jesus Christ. That is just so joggerlicious. Here is K. For some scalar, okay. D sub K. The rows are indexed by K. Oh my god. I have to jump like this? I mean, this is like... This is like reading the worst Python code I've ever... No, this is C... I have said that mathematics notation is like C++ minus the constraint that it has to compile. This is what I mean. This is what I mean. Jesus Christ. I told you this pro these proofs are not very nice. These, this is what I was meaning. Um, how much longer do we have? Okay, we're, very, we're almost done. D new one, determinant of D new one is equal to C, okay, times A new, okay, that makes sense. Okay, there's a lot going on here, so let me, let me maybe give you an example. Okay, um, so, trying to think of a non-trivial example. Let me do one, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, z just seven, eight, nine. I think a three by three example. Let me do a two by two example because that that I'm getting confused already. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, and uh, let's just pick D two one. Okay, and so our our what was what was the fucking retarded notation? Um, God damn it, what was K again? K was the index of a row. Okay, let's let's just try to figure out what the larger scale logic is and then it'll make maybe make Jesus Christ look at this. Look at this bullshit. Look here. Where where is my fucking pointer? There we are. Look at this. Minus or plus? Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, V is equal to K. <sighs> so K is the index of a fixed row. Okay, and we're trying to prove... What the hell? Okay, I, I'm gonna get the book. I'm gonna get... I can't open up two copies of the book. Where the fuck is my copy of Arjun? It's over here. Okay, what page are we on? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up the book on my... the physical book on here. 1.4.8. Where is that? Jesus Christ, we're like... When you hold the physical book, we've like made almost zero progress. It's 520 pages long. We're on page 22. Christ's sake, i got to hurry up. Okay, 1.4.8. Let me find this. Okay. Let A, B, and D be three matrices, all of whose mat entries are equal, except for those in the rows indexed by K. Okay? Suppose, furthermore, that D sub K is equal to C A sub K plus C prime B sub K. Okay, so A, B, and D all equal except in the row, except for those row, those, except for the rows indexed by K. 
let me let me copy the exact phrase. A, B, and D. Okay, let me let me copy down the exact phrase. Let A B D be three main. matrices all of this fucking thing this is why I hate fucking object oriented and imperative languages and, and Lisp and JavaScript and all that retarded bullshit and this is why I like Erlang because in Erlang when you define when you use a variable it has to be visual you also can't just invent stupid fucking random notation like this. In Erlang, you have to, if you want to use a variable or a pattern, if you want to use some value, it you have to state what it is visually close to where you're using it, and you can't also do this retarded, like, floating thing where K can, where you don't specify what K, Jesus, a fucking crap. The CIA pisses me off so much. In fact, we're going to use green because to honor the fucking glow, glow in the dark. Arden, you glow in the dark. This is this is just garbage. Okay, all of whose I'm going to make sure to have. I'm going to like that'll calm me down. Is photoshopping Arden with his face glowing in the dark. Jesus Christ. Except for those in the rows indexed by K. So I just did a video on uh, Kfabe that's on BitChute and Rumble. Um, I put the first in the Entropism series up on YouTube. Um, Entropism is, uh, I guess, a religion I'm starting. And um, <clears throat> I talked about how the Glowies have turned mathematics into being much more complicated than it needs to be and there's market pressure to make it seem complicated and impenetrable and you're seeing it right here this is the this is this is the glowy psyop you're looking at the glowy psyop right here all of whose matrix let me just write this for those in the rows indexed by k Suppose, furthermore, you know what, it's going to be much faster, it would have been much faster if I went back and took a screenshot, but uh, you get to hear about the glowies. DK equals CAK plus C prime BK. For some scalar C and C prime. then delta of D is equal to C delta of A plus C prime delta of B. God damn it. Fucking CIA. This is what happens when you let the CIA 
into your math department, you come up with shit like this. The French invented the CIA. Um, <clears throat> all right, for Christ's sake, okay. Okay, so nu ranges over all of the rows, and k only ranges over the rows that are distinct. Okay, so I don't know the structure here, but... nu is equal to k. They're both, like, in, we're in a nested for loop, and I guess we're in if v is equal equals k in a double for loop. So k is over the range of rows that are different, and... But what would... <sighs> shaking my fucking head at the CIA. This is the CIA. This is what the CIA has done to mathematics. Okay. The row that we operate on has been deleted from the minors. Okay. What? So they are equal. But they aren't equal. Because k is in a range, it's not a single row. This, I think this argument is actually wrong. Because K is not fixed, it ranges. Who the fuck is texting me? Better not. CIA listening to this conversation. It's, it's Craig. Okay. Okay. Uh, do not dis... So I... I have, uh, there's people who can text me and break do not disturb, and so that's why I checked my phone, is because it might be an emergency or something. Okay, but this, this time I just forgot to turn on do not disturb. Okay, it's not that Craig isn't important, but, it, you know, he lives on a different continent, so he's not going to call me because there's an emergency, or text me because there's an emergency. Um, <clears throat> anyway. It, this I think is just wrong, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write that in orange. Remember this was remember this was Trump's catchphrase. Wrong. I think this argument doesn't work. I actually think that this is an error in the proof because k is it, I'm I'm got to be missing something because k is in a range so. So they are... Is there something I'm missing? So they are equal. Oh, maybe it's saying that... I have no idea. So I, I may, maybe in uh, Revelation I'm, I'll clean up this argument and try to make it work, because this doesn't make any fucking sense. Okay. Um, v is not equal to K. Because we're in a double for loop. We're in a double for loop. Okay. Jesus Christ. If we let a prime k, b prime k, d prime k denote the vectors obtained from the rows by dropping the... Okay. Then the a prime k row. Yeah, okay. Case one, case one would work if K was fixed, but K is not fixed. It's not fixed. Let A, B, and D be three matrices, all of whose entries are equal, except for those in the rows introduced by... in the rows indexed by K.
So maybe, maybe, maybe k is fixed because we're only doing linearity on one row at a time. So therefore, k is ranges over a single value in the for loop, in which case case one is correct. He's got to make this clearer. This argument fucking sucks. CIA, CIA. Anyway. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Okay, C prime by induction. Case two makes sense. Okay. As long as k was sing was single valued, which I guess in context it is, but I mean, again, C plus plus minus the constraint that it has to compile. Jesus Christ. Suppose that rows k and k plus one of a matrix are equal, less v or nu. I guess. You know what? Fuck the Greek letters. You know what? That's v equals k or k plus 1. The minor avi has two rows equal, and its determinant is 0 by induction. Therefore, at most, two terms in 1.4.5 are different from 0. On the other hand, deleting either of the equal rows gives us the same matrix, so... k plus 1, 1? Look at this notation! What does this mean? What the hell? So it's saying that two rows of the matrix are equal. I don't even remember what the fuck we're supposed to be proving. Um, what, what the hell are we proving? We're proving... We're proving that our formula for the determinant has these three properties. Okay. Suppose that the two rows are equal. Unless nu is equal to k, okay, so the so its determinant is zero. Therefore, at most two terms in, I'm not. What what is 1.4.5? 1.4.5 is the recursion is the expansion by minors formula. Shaking my head. This is just joggerlicious bullshit. Anyway, you know. A, K, what the hell is K plus 1, 1? What the hell does that mean? What the hell is, what, what does that even mean? Oh, 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 oh. Let's put uh, commas between them. So if it's A, K, comma, 1, A, K plus 1, 1, Maybe I should look in the printed book, because what page are we on? This is 23. Let me look in the printed book. No, it's just, the formatting is just as stupid in the printed book. Okay. Determinant of A is equal to... So what it's saying is that if two rows are equal, are, are equal, then their expansion by minors, the minors are equal. Minors are what happens when you cross out a row and column. So if you cross out either of the rows, it doesn't matter which one you cross out, you get the same matrix. So that that's what he's saying. And so the determinant, the, these two, these two co so he's saying these two coefficients are equal and these two determinants are equal and uh, red. And these signs are opposite. So therefore the outcome is zero. That's, that's what he's saying, okay. 
This better not be some other retarded proof. I'm, I am at the end of my rope. I need a drink. All right. A square matrix A is invertible if and only if its determinant is different from zero. If A is invertible, then determinant of A inverse is equal to determinant of A inverse. Okay, that, I proved that earlier. How do you prove the determinant of the transpose? I actually don't know that. Um, okay, property C follows from property B. Okay, so A, I already proved that. I already proved that, okay. So for the so you prove B for the elementary matrices and then split based on right if a if a is non invertible neither is a transpose how do you figure that I'm not convinced about that I got to think about that but I also don't give a shit anymore yes yeah, C is obviously a property of B okay all right I'm done. I'm going to try to make a funny thumbnail of Michael Arden where he glows in the dark, and that'll make me feel better. All right. Um, Jesus Christ. All right, I'm done. Thank you for watching all the way through. And I, I, I do... I am angry bitching, but, I mean, it, it is... I shouldn't be so harsh. I mean, he's a good... Arden is Arden is one of the most influential figures in the in mathematics. Um, he he's yeah. I I shouldn't you know I I am kind of speaking out of turn, but also I mean look I mean this argument th this this was just such I mean the notation the notation I mean I think my complaint is valid, but I'm I'm speaking this uh, you know fuck that social bullshit. This this notation fucking sucks. Anyway, um, thank you. Uh, I think I think I will write a revelation at some point. It's not high on my priority list, but a revelation at some point. You know what? It is high on my priority list because the determinant um, is important in geometric algebra, which will be important in uh, QAnal and algebraic calculus and all that. So maybe I'll write a um, revelation where I really iron out this argument because um, he he's going. So beginning of this is page 18, and we get we end at page 24. So in six pages, he's going over something really complex and necessarily has to condense it quite a bit. So if it was me, I would probably take 60 pages to make the same argument. All right. Thank you for watching. Art and Glows in the Dark. Bye. Thank you.